to St. John, the third chapter. <laughs> He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Uh, this past week, I got to take the 4th, 5th, and 6th graders out to Briarwood for their Lenten retreat. And we had a good time, and it was nice. And what was even nicer for me is that I didn't have to run anything or plan it. I just had to show up and chaperone. But I still wanted to get there early and make sure everything was going OK. So I pulled up about 20 minutes beforehand. And Janelle had registered the kids on Wednesday. And so I was just walking in to make sure all the names were on the list. And at this table were uh, the program director for Briarwood and a bunch of, of different youth directors. And I calmly walked in and I introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Kyle from Calvary. And the program director from Briarwood looked at me kind of puzzled and said, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, no, yes, I really am. I really am Kyle from Calvary. He was, he was very confused and it went back and forth for about five minutes. Um, but we eventually figured out that I was Kyle from Calvary. That was true. That was true. But I found this story really funny, but I think it's actually a really natural entry point for where I want to start uh, today. I'm going to do a little bit of Lutheran theology now, so don't hate me, just bear with me for a little bit. You guys have heard of it before, but it's called the both and. The both hand, kind of on the one hand, on the other, okay? So just like this program director from Briarwood, Aaron, was not technically wrong. He was both right and wrong all at the same time, okay? And it's, it's something that we claim as Lutherans all the time. We are both saint and sinner, right? Okay? Uh, we proclaim the two kingdoms, that God is present in both the world and not in the world, in the secular and the sacred. Luther said, we are free lords of all, subject to none. But we are also perfectly dutiful servants of all, subject to all. We are both and, right? God's promise is revealed to us in both bread and wine. Okay, see a pattern? Both <laughs> and, right? Okay, and then we talk about around Christmas time, and actually throughout the year that God's time is both not yet and now. The both and, okay? So simply put, our faith is built on tension on paradox, on two opposing things, some might say, but at least different things that 
balance or kind of oppose and just deal with each other in just in different ways. We get today to hear Nicodemus have an internal dialogue and an external dialogue trying to deal with this same tension, right? Nicodemus comes to Jesus, a man, I'm assuming, who has at least a little bit of faith. And I say that because he says, Jesus, you must be sent from God. You must be sent from God because no one can do the things you do without God. So he must have a little bit of faith. But then he asks Jesus all these questions, right? How can someone be born from above and be born of flesh? Well, how can these things be? And Jesus says, what? It's both and. <laughs> it's both and. And that's where we're going to engage today. Because the problem with both and questions and both and theology and paradox in general is that it's sticky and it's tough and it makes us want to ask questions. And that's good. Because when we engage ourselves in the text, right, when we dive in and we kind of put ourselves in the role of one of the people, it's really easy for us to see ourselves as Nicodemus today. Well, how can this be? Right? How can someone be born of both flesh and water and spirit? Now, we could do the theology of baptism now, but I got grief for going long last time. And I'm tired because I lost an hour of sleep, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not. But I want us to at least think about questions. And I think it's really natural for us to think about questions during Lent, right? We talk about Lent as a journey in almost a cliché type of way, right? We're on our Lenten journey. But we're invited to do this kind of work, right, in our lives, to engage our faith in different ways, to reimagine how we see things, to question, to interpret differently. We started Lent last week with the temptation of Jesus. That's the story we heard. And we were asked to reflect and respond to maybe the ways that we're tempted in our own lives, the way that we give in to vices. And this week, I think we're invited to question. We're invited to say, well, how can these things be? For Lutherans, like I said, that's really easy because we question all the time. Right? Or at the very least, we just say, well, it's a both hand, we don't want to deal with the questions. But that doesn't mean it's any less challenging. I remember when I started seminary, you have to remember now that I graduated with a math degree. There always was a right answer. <laughs> always. There might be different ways to do it, but there was only ever one right answer. And I must have been my second or third class, and the professor said, I want you to write just a few pages on faith. I said, okay. I remember sitting and staring at my computer screen for probably two or three days before sending an email. Can you just tell me where you want me to go with this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Just tell me, you know, the direction, maybe the first step. <laughs> and I'll remember the response was so earnest. Mr. Szymanski, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> there's just an answer. I have no shame in telling you that's the hardest assignment I have ever had to do in my entire life. Three pages on faith. Oof. <laughs> yeah, don't try. That's the same problem we have today. I read one commentary this week that said that the true challenge of being a both and church is that we live in an either or world. Mm. Right? It always has to be mm. one or the other. We operate in definites. You watch whatever news that you watch, but whatever news it is, their answer is right. Forget the other side, right? My answer is wrong, your answer is right, or vice versa. Back and forth. It's a my way or the highway attitude. There is no room for that little gray area that we like to live in. It's only ever black and white. And I think Nicodemus is a perfect example of that same problem, right? Even though the biblical world was different than ours, 
it actually isn't quite that different, right? They still operate in definites, in absolutes, in answers and solutions. That's why he says, how can these things be? There must be one right answer. Now, typical of the Gospel of John is that John wants to get us eventually to some form of an answer, right? It's like maybe one long lecture you can think of it as, from not knowing to knowing, an enlightenment type of piece, right? We missed, but really briefly in the beginning, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, which for us is supposed to mean he doesn't know what he's doing, right? He lives his life in the dark. But that always confused me, and I read a lot of things this week that said, well, Nicodemus wasn't a man of faith. I said, well, yes, he was. He believed in the divinity of Jesus. And I thought to myself, Kyle, how can Nicodemus both be a man of faith and a man without faith? Silly Kyle. It's a what? A both and. Right? Nicodemus is a man with faith and without faith. And I think that's often where we are. We treat faith, right, like a possession. It's something that we have. We can go pick it up at the Dollar General. I've got faith and you know. But in this passage, and all through the Gospel of John, faith is not a thing. It's a verb. And a verb is, because this is school this morning, an action, right? It's something that we do. And we too easily assume that it's not. We don't live faith enough. We want to treat faith as an either or. As a black and white issue. As we've got it and you don't. But faith isn't that. It is everything we do. It's everything we say. It's how we respond to the gospel. Faith is when we question. Right? That is faith. Faith is belief in, but also a lived response to John 3.16. Everyone knows John 3.16. I talked to Phil a little bit this week, and we thought, maybe I should just stand up here with a hat and a John 3.16 sign for 10 minutes and see what happened. I might do that at the pub church tonight. I'm still being, uh, it could be fun. It could be fun. But even though we don't like the tension. And we may not like that faith is difficult, is tough. You have to remember that faith is a paradox. It's built on a paradox, right? Our faith is fundamentally founded on the crucifixion. The death of criminals for a king. That's a paradox, right? Someone called the crucifixion this week comes from an old hymn, The Everlasting Instant. I love that. So, The Everlasting Instant. One single moment in history that continues to change the world today. Right? We're embraced constantly by the love of God because of one single event. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son to save it, not to condemn it. The challenge then for us today is figuring out how we're going to respond to that. What we're going to do. How we're going to deal with this either or world. That same author that talked about the either or world said, that to be a both and church is to bear witness to the gospel in a way that is always including and never dividing. We have to allow for the possibility that our faith is going to challenge us. It's going to be tough. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be sticky. It's going to be ambiguous. But that doesn't stop it from pervading every aspect of our lives. 
And it shouldn't stop us from asking questions. Ask the questions. But be open to the beauty found in the chaos of the answer. Some things can't be defined as right or wrong, Mr. Szymanski. Sometimes there is just an answer. Sometimes there is just God's answer. And even though I don't necessarily like that, there's comfort and truth in there somewhere, isn't there? It's really kind of beautiful that our faith is both a trust in the promise of God and a lived response to that love. Pastor Phil's not here, but he would say it's the Lutheran two-step. God acts, we react. Right? For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to save me, and to save you, and to save the whole world. Maybe we should stop asking, how can this be? And just live in the love and mystery of it all.